Our first speaker. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Justina Ray. Uh, she is the Executive Director and Senior Scientist of Wildlife Conservation Society Canada. In addition to overseeing the operations of the society, Justina is involved in research and policy activities associated with conservation planning in especially the northern Canadian landscape, with a particular emphasis on caribou and wolverines. Uh, the question that drives her research are rooted in evaluating the role of shifting landscapes in biodiversity decline and our changes in forested ecosystems. These issues include quantifying the impacts of development activities on biodiversity and surveying and monitoring species of conservation concern. Uh, Justina has been appointed to a large number of government-led uh, government science advisory panels in Canada uh, on endangered species listing, recovery of species of risk, especially caribou, and land use planning. She's also authored more than 40 book chapters, journal and popular articles, and has published three books, including a somewhat well-known book, The Caribou and the North, A Shared Future. Uh, Justine is also an adjunct, pro adjunct professor at the University of Toronto and at Trent University, and a research associate at the Centre for Biodiversity and Conservation Biology at the Royal Ontario Museum. And Justina will be talking about losing biodiversity. Is it important if we don't see it? Well, thank you very much for inviting me, and um, and I'm thrilled to be here and see all the interest. Um, my talk is meant to kick off the proceedings in a in a in a slightly different kind of way, in terms of delving into what we mean by biodiversity loss. And then also starting to touch on this theme of, of the intersection between science and policy, um, which is particularly timely right now. When we were invited to uh, talk about this. Um, the world didn't, wasn't, wasn't quite like it is even today. It changes all the time. The threats are, are different and the threats come up in, in, in different ways, which we'll, we'll all be having a recurring theme on that during this, this, uh, this, this larger conversation that we're going to be having today. So I'm going to be speaking both about, uh, you know, trying to frame what, um, what, characterizing what is the biodiversity loss, telling some stories on that score, some well-known species that some may or may not be familiar with, and some stories that are unfolding as we speak, but then also talking about why is it that, uh, you know, the majority of people, although we may be aware of this, why it still isn't particularly registering in terms of of um, actual doing something about it from uh, in the play in the ways that count and finally I'll just uh, start talking about based on some of my own personal experiences this intersection and this link between some some of what uh, the roles of science and policy uh, writ large in terms of uh, what are the kinds of things that we have to we have to be doing to change the situation as we describe it um, so we already got a bit of a primer in terms of in, in what is biodiversity. I mean, it is quite simply life on Earth. It's the building blocks of natural systems. And, and diversity isn't just about sheer number of counts of species. It's, it's the variety within species. It's the variety between species. It's how they express themselves on the landscape. It's how they're organized. And it can be considered at a variety of scales. You can talk about biodiversity at a very local scale, but you also need to keep your eye on the larger picture in terms of uh, regional and uh, national and uh, continental and global scales as well. As well. And that's the, the, those inter the intersections of scales are critically important. Um, the Convention of Biodiversity defines biodiversity loss as uh, the long-term or permanent qualitative and quantitative reduction of the components of biodiversity. So again, it's not just about sheer number of species that drop in and drop out, but it is about um, how that gets expressed in terms of what they do, what function they play, what roles they play, and how that intersects with uh, sort of natural systems. And, um, but it, it's also, you know, we're, we've already been talking about how biodiversity and, and the component species play particular roles and, and services. So it's also about how those services get lost or uh, augmented or changed over time. And biodiversity of, the, is, of this problem is always in the background. It's, it's rather insidious and the issue of climate change has conjured up sort of apocalyptic in, uh, you know, visions. I mean, we've got movies about the kinds of things that can do we can imagine. What, uh, what it would be like if we were buried under the sea or if, or if we were in excruciatingly hot weather all the time. But we have very difficult 
to imagining what it means to lose this biodiversity because it's kind of much more of an abstract concept, but it is very tied to ecosystem and environmental degradation. So it's this sort of sense of loss and decline and just sort of insidious stuff going on in the background that we really can't get our hands around or really understand how important it's going to be and how it's going to play out. But um, those of us who do spend some time measuring it, and uh, this is a particularly interesting index that gets compiled every few years by World Wildlife Fund, which does have kind of a global scope to its operations. And it kind of tracks as long as we have data, which is admittedly in the world of history isn't very long, um, you know, sort of back the, you know, 40 years or so, looking at, well, how are we doing? If we started off at, you know, at this place um, in the 1970s or so, how's it going? Well, it ain't, it's not really going all that well. Um, and, in, you know, we are um, eating into our natural capital, so to speak. And so as we move around and we have these particular indices for measuring this, which relate to the trends and populations that we can measure and know about, which are really a fraction of what's out there against the backdrop of some of the other kinds of changes that are occurring, uh, we have some reasons for concern. And, um, and, and there also, it, this is about the time where others have measured in terms of looking at our kind of ecological footprint, sort of how we interact again with our natural systems and use them up. We're kind of in a deficit situation. And uh, there are, uh, particularly in, in some of these so-called you know, developed countries where we live, we really use up way more of the Earth's um, resources than it can provide. But then let's also look at sort of the components of biodiversity, those building blocks, which are the species. And if we look at sort of the well-known groups, I mean, um, and we just saw a, a slide sort of that looks at this. I mean, how many um, have we assessed? Well, we've done, we, the broader we, has looked globally at, at 52,000 species or somewhat, and, and, and been able to look at them through their, um, uh, you know, using various criteria that we know empirically are um, make them at risk of extinction, which relate to either small population sizes, uh, very restricted ge geographic areas, or showing precipitous declines. Um, and of those 52,000, we've got um, about 20,000 that are at high risk of extinction already. And here's the breakdown in terms of, uh, if you look at of the number of birds that have been assessed, somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of those species are considered to be at risk. I mean, that's kind of amazing when you think about all the number of species there are on the planet, that so many are already in trouble. And then if you look at the ultimate metric, which is extinction, that's really when it's all gone. And scientists really don't like to say that, because there could be one or two somewhere. So when we say this, this is actually a pretty profound statement. And so um, to think that uh, 800 or so have become extinct in the last 512 years that we actually know about is actually quite, kind of um, sobering thought. So I'm going to take you through a few stories here of some sort of species groups. I'm not going to talk about individual species for the next few minutes, but kind of highlight a few groups of species that people are mostly familiar with, a lot of them live in Canada, and they're kind of these syndromes that are occurring. Some of the time we understand the reasons why they're, um, that these declines are occurring, and some of the times, or many of the times, we really don't. But they are working in these ki kinds of groups of species. Now the first one is diadromous fishes. Diadromous means quite simply that these are species of fish that migrate back and forth between freshwater and marine environments. And this is, makes their life very complicated because they can migrate for many hundreds of kilometers. They're exposed to a number of different threats that play out both in marine systems and in freshwater. The majority of these guys breed in freshwater environments like salmon, but then they spend part of their life cycle out in the marine environments. But some, like eels, do the opposite. And so this exposes them to a number of threats. And um, uh, this, you don't have to worry about any of these except to look at the shape of the lines. They're all kind of going down. These are, when, um, for a particular study that was done not too long ago, they looked at 33 or so time series, meaning they had good population information at the beginning of a certain time period and good at the end. So they could actually compare what was going on over time. And in all of these cases, we've got, uh, pretty much all of them, we've got some tremendous declines occurring 
in, of these 35 time series, and we're, ta we're talking about maybe 15 to 20 species of, you know, these are eel, the, this is the American eel, this is the European <laughs> eel, this is, these are across the globe, this is a, um, a, uh, Atlantic sturgeon, some of the salmon species, Atlantic salmon, and about 13 of, their abund of, of these time series showed abundances that had dropped to about 98% of historical levels, and an additional more than 90 of, of 11 of these. So this means that most of those that we examined, where we had the information, not we, these guys, um, were uh, classified as threatened or endangered, and where there was reason to see that there was quite a profound change that had occurred. And indeed, the situation now, if you look at this kind of schematic with a number of these fishes, is that uh, you know, we, they once were a great abundance. They were d depressed uh, more in the last century, more due to overexploitation more than anything. But then, once we stopped that kind of pattern, other effects started coming in that related more to habitat, in particular, um, you know, hydroelectric development in some places, habitat erosion, but also things that we don't really quite understand that are playing out in both the marine and the freshwater environments. And so we get down to this place where we are right now, um, where they are in a completely depressed state compared to what they were, but it's like the new normal. And this is a, a, this sort of sliding baseline phenomenon, which I'll be talking about a couple of times, I'm sure it'll come up again, is, is quite pervasive and very well illustrated with this set of species. But flipping to a completely different topic, let's look at cave-dwelling bats. Now there's about eight or so species of cave-dwelling bats in North America who were doing, going along quite happily until about five, six years ago when all of a sudden a bomb dropped in 2006. A fungus came in that was imported inadvertently from Europe. It showed up in a cave and lo and behold, dead bats started appearing all the time. And this is called white nose syndrome. And it is a fungus. And um, we're talking about the little brown bat, the most abundant bat um, uh, in North America. And we're talking about, this is a schematic of the spread of white nose syndrome in just uh, six years. It's gone at a rate of 200 to 400 kilometers per year. But the scarily scary thing about this is that it leaves in its wake 90% mortality rates in these caves. So these guys, it, it, um, it, it disturbs the hibernation cycle, and um, it, they exhaust their supplies of fat, and it makes them essentially wake up earlier than they otherwise would have and starve to death. This is not a pretty scene, and this, it's, you know, these are the white nose, is, is, the, um, is the, uh, the, the symbol of the, of, uh, and the signature of this disease. It's, uh, this is a situation where they were so abundant that nobody was even really monitoring them a few years ago. All of a sudden, Kosiewicz did an emergency assessment in January, and along with a couple of other species of bat with which it shares its range, called it endangered just in that many years. So this should be a lesson to the huge abundance that can happen and how quickly it can decline. And that's why the proportion that it declines over time is a very important metric for extinction. Because if you've got 90% climb, declines going on over short periods of time, obviously you're heading towards extinction. And certainly there's been distressing predictions of a high chance of regional extinction, at least in the northeastern United States and Canada, in 16 to 20 years of this bat. Um, and that is an extraordinary kind of thing. But particularly when you also realize that some of the roles that this plays as important insect feeders um, which is, is, which, you know, while we can't quantify how important or what's going to happen when they're gone, it is still uh, begs the question about um, that critical importance. And then we switch to bumblebees. You know, there, there's 50 or so species of bumblebees in North America. Who, who would have thought? And they do look different from each other if you stare at them long enough. And um, they are really important pollinators of wild plants and agricultural crops. And it's a kind of a come to think of it syndrome when, you know, people started noticing, wait a second, you know, they're not as many as there used to be. And I'll bet you some of you also think about that. Maybe I've triggered some thought about that with respect to bats. And this is kind of complicated, but here we had a group of scientists that just published a paper last year where they did this imaginative sort of reconstruction, looking back at museum records and trying to decide where the historical distribution of this, these uh, four, 
eight or so species were and compare, go out and collect and compare the relative abundance within the collections today with the historical of before. And if you look at these two <laughs> graphs, we're kind of comparing a species that is relatively stable because if you look, the orange um, records are, the orange uh, coloring or shading is what um, the proportion of what is being collected right now versus versus the museum collections. And if you look at um, the, this rest, uh, the, the affinis species right there, almost no current collections whatsoever. And from that, and looking at where they used to be, which is the black shading, compared to where they've been collected today, they're projecting a 96% decline. And bumblebee collectors all over the world, that has been the impression. And then this study showed some empirical basis. Indeed, four species, four of the eight that they looked at had enormous declines. Um, and also were just not found in as many places as they used to be, up to 87% of those places. So we switch also then to seabirds, which also use marine environments quite enormously. And there was recently a study that looked at that and sort of collected all the information that is known about seabirds all around the world, of which there are some 350 species. And um, indeed, uh, the most threatened groups are probably penguins and albatrosses. Um, and, and if you look, about half the species are, are in, in decline of some sort. Um, and that, again, is, is um, difficult to pinpoint the reasons why. And of the albatross family, 17 of the 22 species are currently threatened with extinction. Grassland birds, I'm leaping around because this shows you that these are not sort of common, but these are about groups of species that are suffering these concerns. Grassland birds, it's not difficult to surmise that there must be a problem when only 2% of the habitat that used to be there, i.e. tall grass prairie, exists today. And we know the reasons. I mean, they were the first most productive ecosystems to go under the plow. Uh, over, you know, 200 years ago, and, and there are a number of uh, constellation of threats that, that uh, keep this like this today. They're, most of these systems are a shadow of once they were, what, what they once were, and those species of birds, many of which um, occur in these areas in North America, um, are tied to those habitats in, a, in very important ways and are showing declines accordingly. And so if you look at those species that have um, that are obligated to be in grasslands, even since 1968, where they were undoubtedly a shadow of what they previously were, there have been declines and very, very tiny, modest recoveries. And so again, half of grassland birds are of conservation concern, are showing significant population declines, those that we can measure and those that we have measured. And, um, and this is another uh, difficult uh, situation. And in terms of historical declines, if you look at big, large mammals, um, which we know to be in existence today, and we know that Canada is a stronghold, particularly Western Canada, of many of them, it is a sobering thought to look at what their distributions used to be, many of which were all over North America. And if you know what the, what the intensity of the human footprint map looks like, these species um, did sh suffer most of uh, their declines in the 1800s, when we, you know, human settlement and accompanying resource extraction pushed them northward. And where they are today, in some places they're in good shape, in other places um, they are in decline, depending on which species you're talking about. Um, and, and that's the story, uh, in a nutshell, for some of those, those animals. Again, if we look at this historical issue, and I want to keep coming back to that, because we have very little sense and very little luxury of being able to measure what levels they once were. Atlantic cod has been a species if, um, that has been in the news quite a lot over the years, and particularly since um, we had to close down the fishery as a result of declines that were just way too deep. But look how far they declined. If you look at that if you, if you look at that, uh, uh, the blip in the, um, at the top, that's in the, um, the blue in the top, that's where we have, uh, where it's been constructed in terms of, scientists have constructed where they used to be. The black line underneath is where the carrying capacity probably is right now of the marine environment. And down here on the right is where they are most recently. 
And these are extreme, you know, extremely profound declines, and we're talking about if we just looked at that particular period by itself, it might not even look that bad. But if you, you must look at these to where you are, have the possibility relative to historical baselines. We very rarely have that information for most species. <clears throat> Europe is an area that really can show us uh, kind of the, the harbinger of the future, in a sense. And indeed, they churn out species red lists um, on a regular basis of things that we don't think about all that much. And, um, but there are extraordinary um, uh, statistics that relate to particular, like 11% of the beetles that depend on wood are um, at risk of extinction. Nearly third, one third of Europe's 435 blood butterfly species. Um, and then also 14% of dragonflies. I mean, that is an enormous amount. And those are often, I mean, we, many people like to think of Europe being sort of 50 years ahead of us. And so we could be looking at them as a future. And one particularly sobering study came out just very recently. And these are common farmland birds. These are birds that sort of have adapted to the European land pastoral landscape. Well, new farming practices that came into play that kind of eliminated hedgerows and other diversity even started placing these very common, well-adapted birds to human landscapes in precipitous decline. And some of which we are uh, familiar with, like the starling, 53% decline. So these are also sobering statistics that we need to pay attention to. And again, those are only the ones that we actually really know something about. And it's very important to say that out of the 52,000 species that have been assessed, almost 20% of them have no data at all. And other species that haven't um, been assessed at all but above those 52,000 species are often because there is no data. There are no data. And so it's, it, you know, it's only for those that we have the luxury of being able to look at time periods and how change has occurred over time and what their conditions are, which really takes a lot of effort, time, money, expertise that is in, um, that we don't necessarily are able to keep pace with the concerns that, that are present. And that's not to mention the one of the species that have not been named yet or have not been discovered. And there are lots of estimates for that, and I'm not going to venture to put any out, except to show in this schematic, for example, that came out from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, it needs to be acknowledged. There's many that we don't know about. Jill had mentioned that already. And so we're, we're kind of projecting or extrapolating what we think is the general syndrome out there only from what we know and what we're aware of, and it is a fraction of what really is out there and what is and what forms biodiversity as we know it. Also, as John said, species have disappeared and reappeared throughout the centuries and um, throughout generations of time and throughout the epochs, definitely. I mean, there's been this sort of background extinction rate that keeps going, but there have also been these mass extinction events, and the most famous of which was 65 million years ago with, um, uh, the, during the Cretaceous period, where there was this huge, what, what is now thought to be a giant asteroid that, 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 um, that plummeted the Earth and that caused that kind of extinction. That's the last, that's that fifth one. But many people today are talking about this as the sixth extinction. And certainly if you look at the background rates, it's many hundreds of times more. But even if you compare it with those five extinction rates, it seems to exceed that, particularly if you project forward. And also the big deal is that previous periods of mass extinction and ecosystem changes were driven by sort of global changes in climate and atmospheric chemistry, and whereas this seems to be very specifically about competition with another species, i.e. humans, and uh, competition for resources. So it is a very different world today than it was, and so this, yes, we have authority to call this the sixth mass extinction, but we also have sober second thought in the sense that this is a very different one in character. And so if we, again, we have to look at this the way it used to be in the future, compare this, look at it at the appropriate scales to really understand the kind of thing that we're dealing with. There have been conservation achievements on the positive side of the lever that absolutely must be acknowledged in this story. There's lots of hard work that goes on.
The most famous, which John actually also kind of mentioned, relates to the, the discovery that the DDT was causing thinning of eggshells um, and really causing problems for bird, iconic bird species like bald eagle and peregrine falcon, falcon and others. And so the, the, this led to a very um, specific action, banning of DDT, which the species responded to absolutely quickly and profoundly. And these species that were in some places at the brink of extinction, quite honestly, with, pair, with very few pairs, responded in a few generations to thousands of individuals and have been taken off lists in various endangered species lists where they are. Certainly, that is an excellent example of where the threat was known, the threat could be isolated, the threat could be responded to, and the species responded to that threat. And that is a good news story. We also have good news stories in the fact that we've been able to reverse some of our other kinds of things that we're doing that also when the threat is known and quite specific and that relates to over exploitation. It's kind of stunning to us to think about a hundred and so odd years ago that people were very, very um, needed uh, hats for, for um, uh, bird, bird feathers for hats and that m many of the species of birds actually went down precipitously. People were beginning to understand that and they could trace it to really this particular um, phenomenon of over-exploitation. That led to migratory bird treaties between U.S. and Canada and, uh, and, and other uh, nations and those actually also resulted in a reversal of fortune for many of those migratory bird species. Same with over-exploitation that occurred with the repeat rifle in the late 1800s, fur, rampant fur trapping. Many of those species were down at the bottom as in, in uh, range re retractions, also quite low numbers, and a reversal of this situation was able to take effect over several generations. Some of these are actually um, are still in recovery, but some, have, some species have recovered quite well, like the beaver uh, and, and otters and, and such things that, that we take for granted today were actually in a very poor situation about 100 years ago. And again, the response was because of um, the ability to um, relate, sp to, uh, deal specifically with this threat and reverse it through, in this sense, quite um, important regulations. We have also had reintroductions in systems, and this is sort of a restoration exercise, and there have been some important successes. The gray wolf is one of the most important successes um, that has occurred in the lower 48 states, uh, where relatively modest efforts to reintroduce, these guys took off, and they're now they've not only uh, been fix, fixated as as um, been able to flourish and reproduce in these systems, but they've actually been able to retake in a modest but important way their old ecological roles. They're still a shadow of what they used to be historically, but it gives you some sense of the profound possibilities with these kinds of acts. Certainly wood bison have also been reintroduced into areas where they've taken off. There have been these important successes. And then also when you relate to restoration, and we'll hear about a great example this afternoon um, in Sudbury, these have occurred also on a continental scale. If you look at the dark green net gain of forest, I mean some of the most um, important examples are in northeastern United States and Canada, where forest cover was denuded with agriculture 150 years ago and it has come steadily back since then. It's somewhat of a shadow of what it used to be. It does not have the same character of biodiversity the same complement of species, but it does represent an, a restoration event that has occurred and that should be documented on that positive side of the ledger. But even with all of this put forward on the positive side of the ledger, we still have this story that I've been telling about overall <coughs> negative trends going and some very disturbing new phenomena where the threats can't be so isolated. The concern also with this is that we have to be very careful about being tempted by, and this is sort of a, um, another uh, schematic of kind of just what's happened to COD um, in the last little while, about looking at kind of blips in recovery and what that means relative to um, you know, what shape is in the species. So if, a, if species or if, if restoration efforts do improve, but they don't relative to the historical, we have to actually keep an eye on that and not be lulled into a new kind of standard that this represents it. We would never do that with the stock market. So why should we do that with uh, respect to species and defining recovery in a new way? 
And again, um, we have to look at that planet index that in summation, even with things on the positive side of the ledger, it is going down and our ecological footprint is, uh, is rising um, from, uh, from, if we look at this from a global scale. What are some of the impacts of this? I mean, one of the most disturbing trends that I see, which I can relate to my own life, is that when I fly four hours in North America and I get out, I go to the same hotel chain, I eat dinner at the same place, and the block and the commercial strip where I am looks identical to the one that I left four hours ago in another plane. There's this general homogenization that is happening that's quite um, well exemplified in the suburban commercial strip, which looks identical no matter where you are. And indeed, it's this same kind of phenomenon, this homogenization that's occurring to our species um, over time. It's the same winners, the same lo types of losers, um, the same kind of the play, uh, those that, that exemplify sort of local flavor uh, from an ecological perspective are losing battles, whereas those that are more generalists and are able to survive everywhere are the one, the species that are able to persist and kind of take over, not to mention the new invasive species that happen. And so we could have an introduction of a widespread weedy species that could perhaps increase biodiversity for a little while in terms of number of species, but in, in a particular area, but if you looked at it again at the appropriate scales, it would actually have a very, uh, it would have led to a l large decrease globally in that ecosystem and biodiversity perspective because everything, even when they're really far away from each other, just becomes that much more similar to each other. And this is a phenomenon we call homogenization. And again, we can relate that to our own lives. Things are just don't have that different flavor and different character anymore even where we live in our local community, human communities, that same thing is happening out there in the natural world, and we have to be able to relate that. And we are getting more and more cognizant of sort of phenomenon that, you know, you could call tipping points. I mean, things don't always work that well that, you know, one day you're, you're here, and then the next day you're, you're in a different system. But certainly, theoretically, and more and more empirically, this can happen, that we get a situation where we have an existing sort of set of circumstances, but the more changes that you put through, at some point it can tip it into a new kind of system in a new state. And we have enough information, enough examples out there, that actually this makes it quite clear that the potential to happen is very much there. It can seldom be predicted, and you never know what's going to actually make that tipping happen. So if you're talking about sort of cascading impacts that John actually mentioned, related to the introduction of zebra mussel. That wasn't necessarily something that could be predicted, that just that introduction would cause such an enormous change in the complement of species that live in these natural systems. Same with the removal of top predators and some of the cascading impacts that will happen that can be perceived all the way down to the vegetation component. The, the character looks quite different because you know the predator is not there to control um, uh, the, the consumer of that, of that vegetation, which then goes haywire. And that's the most simple example. And there's quite a lot of interesting examples, ranging from jellyfish to uh, top predator removal to sea otters to wolves, those kinds of things that, where we're lucky enough to be able to measure, to be able to actually see what the differences are and link those differences to those changes, which is no easy feat, with this concept actually makes a lot of sense. And understanding where that, those tipping points are, which sometimes it could be an abrupt change and sometimes it's gradual. And the nature of those is the challenge that we face, but certainly it is something that we need to worry about. John did talk about ecosystem service. Why is biodiversity important? And, and you know, we, you know, you will hear this a lot, but it doesn't necessarily mean it goes deep in your bones because you can, that you can really understand like how, how it matters, what, what the species complement is out there, why it matters for all these things. But more and more evidence makes it clear that it's actually the general and intact state of bio biodiversity that allows these systems to give these services and provide them in the best possible way. That erosion of biodiversity leads to erosion of these services. And, and time, as it's playing out, is making that more and more clear, and again, that old Joni Mitchell song, you don't know what you got till it's gone. It's absolutely true. And sometimes you can't even perceive it then because there's so much mud in the way. But it is very important. 
And there are some very important links between biodiversity and human well-being that are becoming more and more clear. Obviously, the diversity of life is dramatically altered by human um, alterations of ecosystems, but the same can happen the other reverse direction. Biodiversity, in a broad sense, affects the properties of those ecosystems, which in turn affect the benefits that humans receive from them. And so it's this cycle that if we break that chain, or if we erode that chain, or we compromise that chain, we're going to start seeing more and more, and we already have, not here first, it's other places of the planet. It's all about sort of the trade-offs. And in keeping with that concept of the tipping point that I introduced earlier, there's um, biodiversity really acts to enhance resilience of the system. And that's quite clear when you have the full complement of species, when the erosion hasn't taken place and such things, that you, know, that you can stay in a relatively stable state and you're not gonna sort of tip the ball when the changing, when the, the conditions change and you just remove too much, what's that childhood game where you, where you remove too many of those, those sticks and the whole thing falls apart. We don't know when that is, when that last is, but certainly we do know that, um, and it's gonna diff be different for every situation, every set of species, but we do know that if we have the full complement, it gives us much better chance of overall resilience of that system. And some ecosystems, ha services have been enhanced. I mean, let's face it, we've taken natural capital and some of us, a portion of the human, human population in the globe have certainly um, increased our wealth and it increased our, um, our, our situation. Um, but those modifications to enhance one service have generally come at the cost of others and other people perhaps very far flung. And we're just beginning to play that out in the mil millennium. Ecos the, ecos uh, sorry, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which came out in 2005, something that everyone should read, is absolutely very clear about that because when you look at these things from a global perspective and you look at this from the perspective of trade-offs, of gains made in some places versus losses made somewhere else, it brings it to point in terms of the health of the planet and the impacts of these trade-offs among ecosystem services affect different people in different ways, living in different places. So what is the concern? I mean, most people agree biodiversity loss is a problem. I mean, even the CEOs of companies were um, interviewed in a, in a survey in 2010, and most of them are extremely or somewhat concerned that there's something going on there. And so actually, I would imagine, I mean, all of you have come here because you're concerned. Most people on the street would acknowledge this is an issue. They've probably heard of it. But again, what does that mean in terms of the perception enough to do something about it or enough to really affect the change that needs to take place? And so I thought I'd spend a little bit of time exploring some of the possibilities about how kind of the world affects our perceptions of this as a problem. And if, these are all my own ideas, but, um, and, and there, some of them are gonna be more true for pe certain people as others, but it's the constellation of them all that is of interest, and there, and there are quite a few of them. I mean, first, biodiversity loss is difficult to measure and monitor. I mean, speaking from the point of view of a scientist, of course, I'll put that first, because, you know, I'm only giving you the stories that hit you over the head. There's a whole ton of them where you really don't have that information. I sit on the Committee for the Status of Endangered Species of Wildlife in Canada, COSEWIC, where we make these decisions several times a year, where we look at reports and the data and all the data that there are on many species to see what's going on, and we're never sure. We cannot really tell. Now, sometimes we're very sure, but many times, more often, we're not sure what's going on. And indeed, it's really difficult to measure, and measure these. It takes a lot of investment, it takes a lot of people. It means people also measuring the right things, which I'll talk about in a minute. And in today's climate, this is getting much worse. And we have uh, currently, you know, in the, the current federal budget, huge moves. Um, in a number of different directions, which collectively are decreasing the capacity of science at a time when actually the threats are increasing and where we have plans to increase them more. And so we've got things from eviscerating budgets of long-term research stations to um, ch changing the way um, and the, the type of money that's available for university and professors and their graduate students to, to actually look at some of these uh, things over time, not to mention applied research that relates to difficult to measure biodiversity change. I study caribou and 
to try and get population level information about this, even though I go out there year after year, is an almost impossible task, particularly related to a large area. You need lots of people cooperating over large areas. You need large investments of money. And this is not to, this is what about the species that are completely ignored, where people can't identify them, let alone know where they are, find them, get to them, all those things. It's really difficult to measure and monitor. So if you guys don't know about it, if people don't know about it, it doesn't land on a list, or something like that, does that mean there's no problem? Not necessarily. So the difficulty is very difficult. <laughs> very well done. Well said. Please don't. <laughs> it's not an immediate issue. So look at this graph here, those same CEOs looking at sort of, well, if we relate it to kind of the money that we're losing on this and relative to the likelihood. Uh, biodiversity loss is not really in there as much as extreme weather and other kinds of things that we're much more concerned about immediately. <clears throat> Again, we can't really define it, we can't feel it in our bones, we don't understand it, we don't know what it's going to do, we can't predict it. So it just doesn't register in the same way as that kind of stuff that we can sort of see in a movie coming. We can understand the idea of a big, you know, being dr drowning in a wave. We can understand all these kinds of things conceptually. We really don't understand what that, how that's going to play out among biodiversity. Natural capital has no traditional economic value whatsoever. And so this is a, a particularly concerning issue that under the current model, a country could cut its forests, deplete its fisheries, and still show net positive gains on the GDP. And, and that it is happening and has happened. And we don't figure into the enormous number of water that we need to exploit um, oil in this country. That just doesn't show up as an economic cost. And although many people are doing great work in terms of trying to cost that out, it's not yet part of our system. It's not how we value things. We still think it's free. And so um, that, that is an extraordinary important thing to do. We've got this business of baseline shifting. It's the new normal that keeps occurring. It's sort of like you know, when you get older and your, 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 your baseline for your weight keeps shifting. Like, you know, which ones are very long again. It's the exact same thing here, except over a long period of time. We don't remember fish this big, in our experience, we don't remember fish in a huge amount of abundance. So our baseline keeps changing depending on our particular experience and that cultural tie sort of leaves and so we don't have that. And so our new normal keeps shifting and that's the basis by which we measure progress and success and sometimes we feel pretty good about it because we're not measuring the right thing. We're physically removed from most biodiversity, most of us live in urban environments, we don't see it. Um, and, you know, we can ignore it. We can ignore these issues going on and um, very easily in our day-to-day -day lives. And, and so that's an obvious reason why. You know, biodiversity loss is incremental. It's about sort of all of our decisions that we get made that affect biodiversity happen in a piecemeal basis or one piece after the other. And it can happen over large periods of time. This is a schematic of Norway looking at forest loss as it relates to caribou over time. That's still a long time period in relation to people. Whether they perceive that loss or not, it's sort of another come to think of it kind of thing. There used to be a forest here, but there isn't anymore. Is sort of, it has to kind of dawn in your conscience, and it really doesn't. And that we make all our decisions incrementally, and one at a time, and rarely are we in the position, and rarely are decision-making frameworks in a position where they're able to kind of take a step back and go, like, wait, how are we doing? And um, that also makes it very difficult. We attach more importance to a subset of biodiversity, and when we, it's not everybody, but we kind of think about the things that we use that we care about specifically, and there's a big wave of that going on right now. The Fisheries Act changes have changed um, protection of habitat for all fish species to those that are recreationally, um, uh, commercially, and aboriginally important to, to people. And so that, if you look at from a fish perspective, that winnows down the number of species that we've chosen to protect now to about 20% through habitat protection if those changes do go through. That's profound, and if people don't understand that, you know, that's something, um, you know, the, the, about in terms of the, the, the enormous number of other species that there are that don't get in that net. Is it only important if we use it, if we think about it, if it's in our conscience? Probably not. And we're worrying about biodiversity loss stands in the way of progress, and this is absolutely important these days as well. Environmentalists, uh, being environmentalist is now um, a radical. It's somebody that's sort of a, 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 a against kind of Canadian values. And that's become a new kind of narrative. And it's sort of, well, in changing 
uh, economic climate do we really have the luxury to worry about biodiversity loss? And it's again the short-term versus long-term perspective. Again, a good reason why we're not really paying attention as a collective society. Another reason is we can't really perceive it from the point of view of a lot of these organisms out there. We don't understand the way they look at habitat. We don't understand um, how they look at light. We've gotten used to light, but all of a sudden light you know, it becomes an, a big deal for, for these organisms. Or sound, the soundscape changes profoundly. Um, every species has its own niche in terms of where it can sing. Imagine what that feels like when you've got road traffic in the way. So these things are very important. And we don't know how much is too much. What is too much biodiversity loss? When have we gone too far? That's the question everybody wants to know. The burden of proof is on science to say this will definitely be a problem, should that be where the burden of proof is. And so, again, we get back to knowing where we are in this situation. And um, I want to skip over a couple of slides because I'm running a bit out of time. And just to, un and to wrap up a couple of um, words about, from the perspective of a science um, scientist who actually spends a good deal of time measuring and collecting this information, trying to apply it. We're not much fun at cocktail parties because we, we kind of know too much about what's happening out there. And, and, and so what is our value if we, you know, I mean, you know, people just sort of eyes glaze over because, you know, oh God, another doomsday is this. You just got, you guys are a bunch of pessimists. But, but the thing is, is that we're, we're trying to document that change, and documenting change is an absolutely important and fundamental aspect of this whole enterprise. But it's a cycle for us. We don't know the truth. We're constantly going after it in a, in a very experimental way. There's huge amounts of uncertainty related to it. We're going to change our mind over time as we get more information. So we're kind of cycling around here, right? But the problem is, is that where do we enter into this? Because science is not the truth, and there is a lot of uncertainty. And science is not the decider, nor should it be. Really, we've got other policymakers who are in their own kind of independent cycle. And how do we get each other together? Because communicating what is, is, is important from the perspective of either ramifications of policy decisions or, or foundations of policy decisions is absolutely critical. And we, scientists and policymakers are in fundamentally different environments. They, they have few opportunities to meet. They've got different priorities. And um, you know, scientists may be able to very zero in on extinction risk and concerns about the species and what are the consequences of biodiversity loss. We can put blinders on. But policymakers have a balancing act. and They have to worry a great deal about many, many other things that we can only imagine. And so um, one of the consequences of that problem is that science gets kind of put in the, in the pot with a whole bunch of other stuff and spits out a policy decision. And rarely do you understand the extent to which that policy decision actually deviates from science. Where have those trade-offs been made? And it's more and more important for people to actually understand that. Science has got to have its transparent place so that there's advice there that says, OK, you're deciding this, these are the ramifications, or this is the problem, these are the consequences. And that that's clear to the public. And that when that decision is made, also, those that are making the policy decisions that have to weigh in on a lot of other decisions are very clear and honest about the trade-offs. This is what we've decided to do because of society. And it deviates from the science. Unfortunately, this is what we get most of the time. Yes, we consulted scientists. Yes, this is a science-based policy. But rarely do we understand or know what that science advice really is. And so that's kind of what we need to get to. And we don't want to get to this. And we want to, to really um, get to a situation where we can have that, that transparent place. Um, and and uh, you know, science can help ensure that decisions are made with the best available information. But we aren't going to actually make the final, final decision. And, and that, that is, that's a very important thing for us to all to remember. And I'm sorry I've taken up a little bit more time, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. times in your talk you referred to the stock market and on one occasion there was a slide that showed a projection that showed some kind of calculation of a stock market company or a bank or something and something that really troubles me is that this society is based on 
um, money making money. And people generally want to have energy stocks because energy stocks make money. If we personally, not relying on the government, um, not relying on industry, but if we personally took responsibility and took our power back from the oil companies by not investing in them, I'm not an economist, but, but what is the possibility of the effect of that? <laughs> I'm not an economist either. Um, the, I think that those kind of things can have important uh, effects. Right now it's kind of a boutique, uh, it's sort of a very few who, who mm -hmm. deal with ethical invest, investing and, and often sort of the, the more conventional model will be to, to not worry about, you know, that's, that's not where, where you want, want to put your money and, and so the conventional aspect is not to do that. Certainly you would need a, a large number of people to make an impact. But the other issue that's very concerning is that everything is intertwined. So where do you draw the line? Because many companies and even foundations who give away money now have, have you know, some of their, their capital is, is based on, on, on the same kind of thing. So, so drawing the line in terms of, of all, where, where you draw the line in terms of, of where all these different components intertwine and, and are affected by one another is a, is a very complicated thing in this equation. So it's not so clear that well, these companies you stay away from and these are fine in that regard. And so uh, that's one of the big challenges that, that are going to have to be grappled with. Is this one on? Oh. Um, I know as a high school student, you know, I'm, I'm the generation coming up and I'm watching the news and I'm going, oh my goodness, what are you doing to me? Um, what am I doing to you? <laughs> maybe not you personally. But my question is, in your opinion, what is the single most important thing for the government to do on this issue? If you were to give them one command that they could do, what would it be? Hmm. <laughs> well, uh, the first thing, you're talking about the federal government? or <laughs> yeah. yeah, the first thing would be to uh, keep pace with the, I mean, show some restraint, number one, and, and keep pace with uh, the changes that you're, you're be knowledgeable about the changes that you are promoting and and invest in the science to be able to uh, measure and monitor those changes and be able to adapt your policies accordingly. Right now it's 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 heading in a in a direction it's a runaway train um, and and all of the supporting services are are being cut off in terms of being able to keep pace with that. Um, so we have no prayer of being able to understand what the consequences of these changes uh, that are forthcoming in terms of this new uh, push for resource development into very new areas uh, for Canada, very fragile areas on which we depend for many services. Um, and so this, this should be reversed, number one. And so a good first step would be to not put in almost every one of the changes on the environment in the, in the, in the bill that's in the... In the uh, in the offing right now, and that would be a that would be one step to go back to where we were about uh, five months ago. <clears throat> that would be the very first step to make. You presented some uh, some very interesting information on on a number of species that's all quite alarming. Uh, a lot of those seem to be related to species that are of direct interest to, to humans, and as you say, that maybe doesn't reflect all those other species. Are, are there any uh, studies that kind of identify certain species as uh, samples of representatives of large groups? and? Uh, that then relate those to overall impact on humans so that we can take all this information and project 
to what the major impact would be on us as a species? I would think the collective set of information that I presented actually does just that. I mean, um, it isn't, we ha have measured those, but though many of those are not important to, to humans in the traditional way. I tried to show how they, they should be important. For example, bumblebees um, are, are important pollinators, but you know, whether we ascribe importance to them in a traditional way is, is not at all clear. That is a very good example of sort of insidious changes that are happening that may be related to insecticide use. Also insect eating birds, which is a, a group of species that I did not put on there. There's a, it's a syndrome occurring with a number of aerial insectivores that no idea from really from barn swallow to uh, to fly catchers and such things that they, you know any all, all birders are completely aware of that they have not seen as many as they used to and have been a very important part of documenting that decline over the last 20, 30 years, um, 20 to 40 years actually. And, and that is a syndrome that really also is reflective of sort of larger changes in the ecosystem. Another set of species that is important are freshwater fish, particularly in southwestern Ontario, where some of earlier changes were related to um, system of uh, more water quality issues, which seemed to be the main prevailing force in the 1960s or so on. Those forces have been replaced by more important, more insidious ecosystem changes related to introduction of different new fish like the round goby and others that have sort of come, led to very profound ecosystem changes that are leading to declines in many of the freshwater fishes, but we don't measure them all that well. And so we only have some idea about the declines. And these are uh, fish that actually need uh, clear water um, to navigate and, 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 and a number of other kinds of, of things like that. But I think that the species that I presented, many of which are not particularly important in the traditional way in, in that we don't use or hunt them, still does as an assemblage um, represent uh, generally what we need to be concerned about. I would... Oh, sorry. Yep. Um, you spoke to the topic of the lack of knowledge about the issue and the lack of caring throughout the general public. And I was wondering, like, what would be a few of the main steps you would want to take? And through that, like, what would be the goal? Would your goal be to find strength in numbers behind this issue? Um, I think uh, general public awareness and is, I think it has happened, but in terms of really expressions of, of care uh, and understanding about how the way that society makes decisions um, probably runs in conflict or does run in conflict in some fundamental ways, so to be able to try and exercise change, because we are in a, in a business as usual approach is a, is a very kind of entrenched perspective. I mean, we do make decisions on a piecemeal basis. We don't value ecosystem components and biodiversity, and those are two very important fundamental things that would need to be changed in order to do things differently. If we thought about valuing and placing monetary value on some of these services that we've articulated, if we thought about the importance of species, if we took away the burden entirely on science and understood that we have a problem um, and not wait for it to be so bad that, that we have to do something about it. All of those things are, are things that will come more naturally with, with increased awareness and also with increased voice and understanding that try to shove us out of a kind of in, uh, sort of entrenched uh, business as usual perspective where we don't know how to do it any other way. And I think uh, that's going to that's gonna take some uh, a sh a shift, a change, a change in how we do things. And that's going to start with you guys. <laughs> I was just wanting to respond to the woman who asked basically about ethical investing and uh, point out that the Auditor General for Ontario in his report for 2011 pointed out that there had been absolutely no cost-benefit analysis done for the renewable energy, that were the intermittent renewables and the Green Energy Act. So you have to be aware of what you put your money into without doing the proper science because this is where the science was lacking in this instance and it's extremely important that that be done first.
because now we have the, the places like Ostrander Point and the shores of Lake Superior, minimally impacted uh, cold water ecosystems being put at risk because of an industrial footprint being extended out into areas that were once protected. Um, I have um, two questions if there's time, but one if there isn't. Um, the first one has to do with the fact that I, it's certainly very clear the value of biodiversity within the context of the ecosystem and within the context of between species. But I wanted to ask, you had um, a couple of uh, charts up, graphs up that were interesting. I wonder when you drill down within the context of species where you where science is trying to figure out how to draw the line between an absolute population that preserves the ecological service relative to the species diversity for the sake of species diversity and I'm not suggesting I think that it's unimportant but at some point in time absolute population may help you with the ecological service versus um, um, the range of species? Well, you're articulating very eloquently a, a sort of a shift that's occurred in conservation biology over the last 10 years where, or so, where, whereas before there was a focus on a concept called minimum viable population, which was like, okay, so how many do we need in order for them to persist over time so that they'll still be around, but we won't lose them. And so it was, you know, it led to very kind of sort of minimalist, reductionist sort of thinking in the sense of, okay, we only need like 500 of them and that'll be fine. But more and more as, as it became clear, um, the services that the species provide, the functions in an ecological role, this has morphed into this notion of kind of an ecological functional population. So it means that, you know, which is always, almost always, but always in my experience, a good deal higher than the minimum viable population. So that you don't really just want to manage for persistence, but you want to manage for embracing that functionality, that how they represent themselves in the environment, how, how the role that they play in, in the larger biodiversity. But as you can imagine, this is very difficult to define. And in terms of recovery planning, and, um, and sort of more government objectives, it, it hasn't caught up in that way. They're still sort of in the, you know, let's, let's get them to persist and not decline anymore kind of situation. And, and, um, and really the science has a long way to go. There are some species that we've been able to define, you know, a pollinator function, you need so and so many in this kind of area to perform that kind of function sometimes and under very specific purposes or, or, or seed dispersal or uh, as a predator, but it's often in small areas and um, takes a long time and a lot of experimental um, uh, manipulation in, in some cases to be able to actually understand. So uh, hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, but then within the context of, of that, if you're talking about pollinators, do you need X number of different species or with less competition from a multiplicity of species, if you still have the absolute population, can they still do the job? Yeah, I mean, so then there's the issue of redundancy. So whether whether there are others that can be re replace them or, you know, if they can take over the niche to do the job. It's a very good question. Um, the science, it, it's very difficult to answer those questions. And if you can, you can only do that on a small place. And, and I would submit an answer to that, that um, while we should strive to, 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 to add science to that, we don't want to put the burden of science that you have to prove that this is, this is needed and that this, we need so many of this in order, to, um, in, in order to, for them to carry on with their function and not to be impaired. Uh, that really, um, the larger empirical basis of evidence that looks to the whole state of an intact biodiversity, that's kind of a better fallback position. Let's Let's try and keep what we've got, um, restore what we don't have, and, and try to assume that that plays some kind of function role for redundant in some cases, great, that we add more resilience. But let's not try and reduce the situation or try to put all the burden of proof on scientists to be able to say exactly how much we need, because in most cases, we're not going to be able to get there. Yeah, okay, very nice. That's it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we'll